Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, our educational seminar with Stanford Healthcare Valley Care. We're so excited they're uh, here today. Uh, we've got a great speaker. I want to uh, just acknowledge my team, Susie Weiss, who was very instrumental in getting the word out. Thank you, Susie. And we have Don Wilson just in my screen. She's right below me. Hi, Don, down there, uh, our, our membership director. So. And I think that's all we have on the team. We've got some board members here. Um, thank you for all for being here to support us. You can raise your hand if you'd like, you know, uh, awesome. So um, let's get started. Uh, I'm sure um, Dr. Ng's got some great things to tell us. So first of all, I just want to thank Stanford Healthcare Valley Care for their support of not only our chamber, but the Tri-Valley Chamber. This is a series of seminars they are, are supporting at the different chambers throughout the Tri-Valley. We are the first, uh, and then the Dublin will be hosting one soon, and, and Livermore, San Ramon, and Danville. So uh, pretty exciting stuff. So uh, we really appreciate your support of the chamber community. Um, so let me introduce our, our guest speaker today. Uh, Dr. Ramford Ng is currently the chief of the Department of Cardiology at Stanford Healthcare Valley Care. He also serves as the medical director of the Cardiac Rehabilitation Center and the Anticoagulation Clinic. I had to practice that word. Dr. Ng strongly believes in providing personalized patient-centered care. His clinical interests include cardiovascular risk factor reduction, coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, and interventional cardiology. In his spare time, I, I don't know where he has that, but he enjoys spending time with his family, hiking, cycling, and volunteering with youth service organizations and speaking to groups like this. So Dr. Ng, it's great to have you. Uh, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Thank you for being here. All right, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Susie. Let me pop up my screen here. Uh, is that showing up okay? Well, good. So thank you for giving me the opportunity, giving uh, Stanford an opportunity to kind of showcase what we're doing and, and kind of educate the Tri-Valley about uh, heart health. Um, Tri-Valley really has been my home. I grew up in Tracy, and uh, in fact, my parents still live there. And during high school, I spent about, between high school and college at Cal, I spent about six years working on and off at the Livermore Lab. And so after I finished fellowship and training and subspecialty training, my first and only job to date has been at Valley Care for the past uh, 11 years now. And uh, it's a family I have, now I have five kids and that probably occupies just as much of my time as, um, as work and we live in Danville. So kind of try Valley near and dear to, uh, to my heart. In any case, February, as most of you know, and as we're blitzing out there is a kind of heart awareness month. So a lot of opportunities for us to kind of grow and educate the community on heart disease and rightfully so, because it is a, and probably the preeminent player as far as heart as far as cause of death and mortality in the U.S. My screen is not, there we go. So a couple of things I'd like to focus on. One is to just go over coronary artery disease, uh, what we can do to prevent, delay, minimize the chance of coronary disease and then tie in some of the new technologies we're developing in the cardiology space and how we're bringing that technology to Valley Care to our backyard where we can serve our community. So any way you spin it, and it almost seems that it's drilled in so much in public knowledge these days, these, these facts seem obvious, but they never cease to amaze me. When you say that every 37 seconds, someone in the US dies of, of heart disease, and you say that this number one causing, it's always cancer and heart disease, usually heart disease number one, cancer number two, and then a factor of four or five or six lower, you look into things like car accidents and infections, but heart disease kind of first and foremost, and that hasn't changed in the past several years. Um, it's a huge revenue cost to the US, lost productivity, lost uh, finances, and men and women. And for most people, it's not a matter of if, it's more a matter of when, because there's, there are risk factors you cannot modify, and age, family genetics, eventually they catch up, and everyone says father time eventually wins. 
So coronary disease, the, the, if you think of the heart, the heart is not much bigger than the size of your fist, and, but it's a pretty intricate machine. And it takes blood with every squeeze of the heart, it pumps blood that your body's extracted oxygen from through a series of chambers to the lungs to give it oxygen and then back out to the rest of your body. And if you say, I, I squeeze my heart rate, my pulse to 70 beats a minute, and you do the math, that translates to give or take 100,000 squeezes per day. And you extrapolate that over the course of weeks and months and years and decades, it adds up. And the analogy I like to share with patients is think of the heart as a house. There's rooms in the house, uh, chambers, uh, and, and the heart, there's atrium and ventricles, there's doors, and these valves that open and close and separate walls, uh, chambers of the house. Electricity telling you when to beat, how fast to beat, and then lastly, coronary, artery, uh, coronary arteries, which is the plumbing. And the arteries that feed the heart are not big. Uh, again, these things pump blood 100,000 times a day. These arteries are in the order of three to four, four and a half millimeters at their biggest. And like a tree, they branch to smaller and smaller vessels. So as you go through life and occur risk factors in crud and cholesterol and plaque, that's coronary artery disease. However minor it is, that small amount of plaque, you may not feel it, but it's something and it adds up. And we've never shown an ability to undo that through diet or lifestyle or medication. So once you have it, you have it. It's more a matter of preventing the progression and preventing the destabilization of it, so to speak. So if you develop enough plaque, enough narrowing, you lead to a supply demand mismatch. You imagine going to the gym and curling some iron. Eventually the, the biceps need more oxygen blood than you can supply. And you feel that burn, heart's the same way. In the heart, it's called angina. And if you get enough blockage long enough, the injured heart muscle actually dies off. That's what, that's what we call a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. So it's a spectrum. As far as risk factors, when we think of many factors that we have some rollover and some we don't. In the US, and again, if I would have had this talk 30 years ago, these all sound very novel, very foreign. And through public policy and public educational forums between TV ads and print ads and forums like this, these have become so commonplace. You asked, I asked my five-year-old the other day and half of these she kind of picked out already. And this was not obvious in, uh, 15, 20 years ago, but it's, we've done such a good job in terms of public policy and public education that these still really are the tried and true risk factors that lead to heart disease. By, all, by no means is this exhaustive and um, not a guarantee. You can have every risk factor checked off here, still have no heart disease, and you can run marathons and be a vegan, still have heart disease. So these are kind of things we can do to favor success, and whether I have one raffle ticket in the, in the lotto or 80, I can still win or lose, but my odds are different. And the top three I separate out because you really can't, you know, that's, that's who you are, and you're born with your family genetics, I uh, can't change your age. So there's not much you can do. The things that we can modify are the ones we focus on. And these are the, the bottom um, seven here. And we have some control over it, either through diet, through lifestyle, through medications. Um, and we've really shown that there really is a strong tie into these risk factors and your chance or the, the age of onset of heart disease. And Chief among those probably diabetes. Um, whether you have heart disease or not, I think it's very important for most patients, most people, most people are concerned about their health to know these kind of numbers. And these are numbers you should be able to kind of speak freely with your primary. And most of us, when you go to primary care's office, they'll always ask you, what's your weight? Are you up or down? Uh, what's your blood pressure? You check at home. And these are things that, that are easy to check nowadays. It's, it's not cost prohibitive for most patients to go buy a $15 scale or a blood pressure cuff, but those numbers really add value because you can ask the number of times that I go to my dentist's office, my blood pressure is wildly different than my home number. And as a physician, I want to treat you what you do 99% of the time, not the spurious time you're in my office amped up trying to find parking and running late. Um, so these numbers do carry a lot of weight, and it just shows that the commitment to you as a patient 
the more you're committed to your own health, the easier it makes the, the physician's job as well, because medicine, your health should really be a partnership. We're, we're past the days of the physician legislating what you do and what you don't do is really the partnership between what's best for you. And it's an equal marriage between your diet, your lifestyle, if it comes to it, medications, but it's not all one and none of the other. Cholesterol, um, a number of ways we look at cholesterol. We check it in screening affairs, we check in lifeline, but uh, cholesterol still proven to be one of the, the biggest tenets of making sure we mitigate our risk. And cholesterol comes in a number of forms. We've always heard the traditional LDL, HDL, triglycerides with the HDL being the good cholesterol, the LDL and triglycerides being the bad cholesterol. A lot of this is driven by diet, but some not. And we have people who I have, the, the, I had a guy earlier this week coming with a heart attack, 45 years old, runs marathons and, and eats better than me. And it's the family genetics. And the truth of the matter is that some cholesterol is absorbed through your gut. A lot of cholesterol is made by your liver. So if you have a great diet, it still may not impact what your liver makes because your cholesterol does play some advantageous role in your body too, but too much of a good thing is not a good thing. And then some of the more emerging risk factors we're looking into LP little a's, particle sizes, CR, C reactive protein. These are other measures that are coming online as time goes, as far as how do we further fine tune our risk, but the tried and true don't lose sight of the, uh, the traditional LDL, HDL triglycerides. You know, and one of the most common questions we're asked is how high or how low does my cholesterol need to be? And the old days we'd spout out saying we want LDL under 130 or under 100. And again, the truth of the matter is it depends. And the analogy I use is, you know, think if you go and want to buy some life insurance and you, when you walk into the dealer's office, you say, how much does it cost me? And the first statement they say, well, it depends. And they have you find an actuarial, you pump in, punch in some numbers and they spit out the more risk you are, the more expensive it is. And the, the lower risk you are, the cheaper it is. And when you customize um, cholesterol management with some low, very similar, the more risk you have, the more aggressive we need to be, the lower risk you have, I'd say, you know what, it's high, but work on it because your overall risk is low. So these calculators can be found online, can be found on number four, but they're kind of, and I'll put up one website up in a sec, but they're uh, atherosclerotic uh, uh, cardiovascular risk predictors. And we use it to, we use it to predict your risk in the next 10 years of a heart attack or stroke. And this is from the, this is based on compiled data from Veterans Health Studies from Framingham, from Physicians Health Studies, but plug in age, blood pressure, uh, cholesterol, whether you're a diabetes smoker, and at the top bar, they'll kind of spit out to you your 10-year risk of a heart attack or stroke. Again, not a guarantee, um, but a risk predictor. And they also have some features you can, you can toggle along and say, if I did everything I could, modifiable, what can I get my risk down to? And in this case, it'd be, you know, 4.8%. And again, coming back to this idea that everyone dies of something and most likely heart disease, again, lifetime risk is still pretty high. But the other nice feature of this is if you scroll down on the page, you can see if I can go and click and say, I want to start a stand or quit smoking, it'll adjust for me what my, what my risk becomes. So you can toggle that and say, hey, what is the impact of being on a stand or getting my cholesterol control? And you can see that. So the, the, the um, website I put up here was the American College of Cardiology, but they're all based off the same calculator formula as you can just Google 10-year ASCBD uh, risk, and they'll, they'll pop up on Google, plenty of these similar calendars. Blood pressure. Uh, as people are getting older, we care more and more about blood pressure because blood pressure for most people is a consequence of kind of longevity and time. You know, quite frankly, every, every couple years, there's a joint national committee that gets together a smart room of people smarter than I and look at the data and expert opinion, and they throw out a uh, guideline saying what your blood pressure should be. And every year, in general, they get to get a bit more and more aggressive. And the idea of it is 
that blood pressure affects you not in the moment in the day, but it's the downstream consequences of years and years and years of high blood pressure. And frankly, if you came to my, our, the current goal, for instance, right now is to keep you under 130 over 80 for most people. The iteration before we were less, we were less aggressive and um, we see the consequence. These people are living longer now and a blood pressure of 140 over 90 may not mean a whole lot uh, today or tomorrow, but a blood pressure of 140 over 90 versus 130 over 80 does mean something 10 or 15 or 20 years down the road. And the analogy is, is going back to the gym. And if I'm going to curl 12 pounds versus 15 pounds, I'm not going to notice it. They feel about the same as far as weights go. I can do 10 curls and three sets and they still feel the same. But if you do that same pattern fall for day and weeks and months and years, eventually the, the guy lifting the 15 pounds will get bigger biceps than the guy lifting 12 pounds. Parts the same way. So a 10 millimeter of mercury difference in blood pressure may not mean a whole lot. Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, at 10, at 10 or 20 or 30 years out, it does mean something. And now that people are not living into their 70s, living into their, their 80s and 90s, we do see that difference. We see the difference as far as earlier heart failure. We see the difference as far as heart attacks, as far as strokes. I see a couple of questions. I'll come back to uh, the questions at the end so I can... So having a hard time toggling between the, the chat box and the uh, talks. Um, so again, the heart, uh, as far as blood pressure, the, and one is unrecognized killers, where one of the hardest things I have to do is ask a 30 or 40 year old kid who feels well and says, you feel well, take a blood pressure med. And they're thinking to me, I feel great. So it's not gonna make me feel any better. And that's true. They say, I feel great, so I don't want to, I have to remember to take a medication, I have to pay for it. Now I have a diagnosis that's going to throw off my insurance policies. And lastly, I, I take a medication, it may make me feel worse because I have a side effect. And all of those things are true. Until you realize that downstream, when you're 70 years old, and your artery are thickened, your heart muscles thicken and stiffer as a consequence of blood pressure, I can't undo that diastolic heart failure you've had because of years and years of, of high blood pressure in the making. So all that does uh, come to pass uh, as people are living longer. So now we're living longer. We've shown that whether you're 70 years old or 30 years old, we want to be on the more aggressive side of blood pressure. And again, the last iteration, formerly we were more lax with it, but now we're recognizing whether you're diabetic or not, we're pretty aggressive with blood pressure. And not all of that means medications. And, and sometimes you can control it with diet, with salt intake, with activity, with stress management, with caffeine, and, and all of those things do help. In fact, if you came to my office and your blood pressure 150 over 85, and the first time I met you and you're otherwise doing well, wouldn't do anything in the moment. I'd say, check your numbers, work on risk factors. These things we talk about, keep a log and come back in a few weeks. If it's not better, then we talk about medications, but you really have that opportunity to impact uh, blood pressure on your own accord. So kind of think we can do to wrap the, the hard part of it, what we can do, we can exercise. All the data show you don't need to be running wind sprints, but we want you moder physically active enough that you know, hard to carry on to leisure conversation comes out to about you know, 20, 25 minutes a day uh, and more vigorous is better. And even children as young as three to five years old, uh, there are guidelines now. You know, in, it's, in that sense, let kids be kids. Let them run around and do their thing. And keep. And I'm, I have the same problem with my kids now, who my oldest is uh, nine and my youngest is four, keeping them off iPads, keeping them off the TV, and just kicking them out in the backyard and say, run around. And as, as a parent, that's probably the best thing for them. So as far as healthy diet, I know there was one question if I can get back to it about, um, you know, I think plant-based diets are good. I think I try not to, from, from my personal practice, I tell most patients, I try not to be overly restrictive. Uh, I ask, I don't know there's one diet that, that applies to every person because guts are different, digestion is different, genetics are different. 
But I always tell most patients to kind of look at what you're doing and what can you do to make changes. And we've tried when I first started saying, here's a cookie cutter, very aggressive diet to lower heart disease. And for some people did wonders for, but for most people, quite frankly, said, you know what? I don't enjoy this life. I don't enjoy my diet. And I know you say it takes 60 days to make a habit, but I'm, I'm three months into it. And I'm miserable. And at some point, patients say, you know, screw you. Life is short and I always want to enjoy myself. So I think the better part of valor is, is to acknowledge that medica medications, uh, diet, lifestyle, you can push people in different ways. People can respond in different ways. And when it comes down to it, this is where that personalized relationship with you and your provider and what your expectations are and what the providers are really need to mesh. You know, with my five kids, we took them out to a pediatrician uh, when we were, when we first started having kids and I thought the first one was great. I asked him questions. He answered them perfectly fine and satisfactorily. And I walk out and my wife says, no way in hell we're going to see this guy. I was like, no, what's wrong? And she goes, well, every time you ask him, he just spits off answers on top of his head and, and he doesn't look anything up. And he's been practicing the same way he has for 20 years. I said, well, you know, <laughs> We'll go find someone else. So we went and, and did our research. We found someone who was you know, UCSF trained and fellowship at, uh, at the Brigham. And they're practicing. And on some level, they're a little intimidated because I'm an interventional cardiologist. My wife's a, a psychiatrist. And we asked her very similar questions. And everything we asked her, the, the doctor gave a great answer. She says, wait, let me check. And she would go and look it up in the medical resources and give us a very similar answer. I said, this is great. She knows she's on her game. She looks everything up and current data. My wife walks out because we can't see her. She doesn't know anything. And everything we ask her, she looks up. So when it comes down to it, I really feel the relationship between the doctor and the physician or the doctor and the patient really has to be personal and be catered towards kind of expectations. And, and I think plant-based diets are great, but I think at some level for some people, it's, it's much of a challenge. You can get enough calories, nutrition, protein with a plant, pure plant-based diet. But I know that most patients in my practice wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> um, so other tests to consider, we won't go through it here is for sake of time, but the talk, there are other ways of evaluating risk, either through blood testing, through coronary calcium scoring. Most of these we do offer at Valley Care, and I'll highlight a couple of those in a, in a sec. So it can bottom the take home message as far as heart health, a lot of it is kind of in your own hands as a patient. And these all seem very common sense and very obvious. And, and I can assure you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, they were not obvious. And to a lot of the population, this is still not obvious. So it really is kind of taking your own health in your own hands, both from your diet and exercise. And everyone says, I'd love to not take meds and do it through diet exercise. There really is an opportunity to do that. So I wanted to use the last few minutes in this talk to just go over and highlight the, the services Cal Valley Care has really kind of grown and offered. And we, we really have not had this available in years and years and years. I've been here since 2011. It's really exponentially taken off in the past since Stanford's affiliation with us. We've had the opportunity financially and logistically to grow in waves we've not seen uh, since Valley Care's inception. And I'm sure we've seen a lot of data already and we just celebrated our 60 years. But 1961 opened as a hospital in Livermore, only 46 beds. It was until 1989, we had a ambulatory care center in, in Pleasanton and added on the Valley Care Medical Center in 1991. That's 67 beds. And for the most part, we, we kind of stayed status quo until Stanford uh, joined us in 2015. We did start our cardiology, interventional cardiology and CV surgery services about 10 years ago. And since that start, we've done great, uh, great results, uh, but very limited volume. We had 60 to 65 cases every year for the past several years. And what's gonna happen the past year plus has been a, a pretty logarithmic jump in terms of our, our volume and our service offerings. Um, Jim Longoria and Rhea Curry, our CV surgery faculty started in June of 2020. And remember our number, our volume was about 60 cases a year. First 12 months of them on board, we've done 146 uh, major cardiac surgery cases. 
uh, vascular surgery, Dr. Cassie and Dr. Avis are kind of faculty vascular surgeons. And they, they keep our cath lab just as busy as we do as interventional cardiologists. And from the cath lab uh, side, thing from diagnostics to elective stents, to urgent heart attacks, to Russian born, fixed within 60 minutes. We've done all told about 767 in the past uh, 12 months leading up to June. Um, services we do offer currently, from the heart surgery standpoint, the, the bread and butter cabbages, valve repairs, replacements, uh, atrial fibrillation management. This is probably one of Dr. Longoria's strong suits and what his clinical interest is managing atrial fibrillation and being able to treat and cure atrial fibrillation either independently through a fully thoroscopic approach from your chest without having to open the chest wall up or doing that in combination and collaboration with electrophysiology where they go and treat atrial from the inside of your heart that he treats her from the outside of your heart and, and dramatically reduce the incidence of atrial fibrillation. Well, there are about six, seven million people in the U.S. who have AFib, and it's becoming a growing, growing problem because we're recognizing it more as a huge stroke risk, a huge heart failure risk with atrial fibrillation and aortic management. As far as vascular surgery, you know, Dr. Cassie and Avis, they really are on the forefront. A lot of the newer technology we're doing, we're bringing to the vascular surgery space and the bread and butter carotid stenting and uh, carotid endorectomies, but you know, transcatheter um, carotid revascularization uh, is something newer on the forefront they both do. Uh, thoracic and abdominal management, being able to go and fix an aorta, uh, um, aorta is tearing endovascularly without having to do open heart surgery, open abdominal surgery, has been a, a huge mortality and morbidity benefit. And, and then bread and butter uh, AV fistulas. Interventional cardiology, we've been a STEMI receiving center, treating urgent heart attacks, dating back 10 years plus now, having CV surgery as our backup. And um, it's been a great, we have about 60 to 70 urgent heart attacks to come in a year from, uh, and these are, these are the kind of heart attacks where the paramedics bring them in. And from the time they hit the ER door to get through the, through the ER to the cath lab, get on the table, we get a wire up and open the blockage, national guidelines under 90 minutes, we do it in about just over 50 minutes. And so that's been, but it takes a lot of, whether it's three o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the evening, that time still holds. So it takes a lot of logistics, a lot of maneuvering. And, and we're lucky because, you know, Livermore brings their cases here. Tracy does not have, a, have an interventional cath lab. Uh, Castro Valley doesn't have a cath lab. So we're quite fortunate that we, we are able to offer the service here. Um, electrophysiology, currently we are doing devices, pacemakers, stents, uh, pacemakers, uh, loop recorders, defibrillators, and we're going to expand that into a uh, electrophysiology ablation service in the next few months. And just, I can't stress enough, and this is over, often overlooked, but our direct partnership with Stanford has allowed for a lot of the collaboration. We get patients fast-tracked from hospitalized patients to outpatients to more advanced care when it's needed. Uh, and there's a couple last slides going over some things that were, uh, we started transcatheter aortic valve replacement that's going in and replacing the aortic valve without open heart surgery. We started in October, we had about five cases now and they all have gone well. All, every patient's gone home the very next day and recovering, rehabbing that day. Uh, electrophysiology going to ablate atrial fibrillation flutter uh, that'll be coming online in the next two months. And CardioMEMS is a, a little program where you put in a small little bat wing disc, I'll show you in a sec, that allows us to better monitor atrial fibrillation. As far as the infrastructure growth, um, we're developing an outpatient comprehensive cardiac and heart and vascular center to see patients where the, the cardiac surgeon, the vascular surgeon, the cardiologist, all in one collective network uh, interfacing every day. And the hospital adding additional cath lab, revamping our two current cath labs and bringing along the enhanced imaging capabilities allow us to do these st structural cases. So just a couple of slides on the outpatient center. Um, 12, it'll be on the first floor of the 5565 building, 12 offices, uh, 12 exam rooms, office space, conference space, procedure labs. And then on the inpatient side of things, slated to open our new cath lab in December of this year, you know, $39 million infrastructure investment by Stanford over the next several years to, 
to see us through uh, this growth. So exciting, exciting times for us. Uh, later this year, uh, clips to make the mitral valve less leaky, left atrial appendage exclusions to close the aortic valve or to close off the uh, left atrial appendage and make you less prone to stroke via AFib, a dedicated pulmonary hypertension program. So here are a couple of therapies I highlighted. One, this is the transcatheter valve to be able to not the third picture there and left the AVR, that's traditional open heart surgery. You kind of get a zipper job through your sternum. In many patients now in the first window here, the TAVR, we go in completely through the femoral artery, two artery needle pokes and one vein needle poke, put that valve in under an hour and have you home the very next morning. Um, as far as pacemakers, we walked, it's again, the, in a relatively new technology, the first pacemaker in the 1950s, there are big boxes you lugged around, and then they gave you wearable boxes. And up until 2015, pacemakers looked like this uh, 2015 fixture, two leads. We still use this, but in some patients who don't need all the capabilities pacemaker, we can put in what looks like about the size of a vitamin, and we put that right in the heart. And if you can see in the bottom row there, it's that one little vitamin that's just inside our, it takes about half an hour to put in. And that battery lasts up to 13 years and does what a pacemaker does. And not for every pacemaker patient right now, but the technology evolved to say that less infection risk, uh, you don't see it on sitting in your chest wall and does everything a pacemaker needs. Um, outpatient center, Rather than wearing the clunky heart monitors we've worn formerly, uh, that look like an octopus sitting in your chest, we have these small band-aids you can put on now, two weeks of monitoring. If you have suspected AFib, you've passed out, you've had strokes we can't explain. And if two weeks is not enough, we have these small microchips that look like uh, loop recorders. They look like little paper clips you inject under the skin. And this is three years of monitoring, and we do this at Valley Care, and it takes under a minute and three and a half years of monitoring just by having a cell phone size box at home. Uh, this is the cardio maps. People have heart failure. People come in with heart failure. We say, what's your weight? How much fluid are you getting in? Uh, what's your kidney function? And all of those are helpful, but they're imperfect. This uh, cardio MEMS program is a small little bat wing device. We put it into your pulmonary artery. It takes about 10 minutes to put it in. And we can get a much more diagnostic number of predicting when you're going to go into heart failure so you can make changes preemptively. And that'll come online later this year at, uh, at Valley Care. This left atrial appendage occlusion, this is something we're looking at for later this year. This is also a same idea. If you have atrial fibrillation, we give you a blood thinner. And the idea is we thin the whole body's blood so we can keep that one little small left atrial appendage thin. Uh, thin, so it won't clot. So if you were getting surgery, the surgeon would go clip off that atrial appendage. So nowadays, some boys can't be on a blood thinner, and we can put in what looks like a little jellyfish. We put it in in under an hour, and once this thing seals up in about 45 days, you can forever be off of blood thinner and effectively do the same job as being on a blood thinner. So, and then lastly, electrophysiology. Dr. Kang, Dr. Shaw, and Dr. Chan are electrophysiologists here to go in and theoretically cure AFib or blade AFib. Um, you would ask me five, 10 years ago, I'd say, stay away from this with a 10 foot pole because you're going putting scar in the heart and it recurs and technology has gotten better, seal has gotten better, that it really has been the forefront of we're doing this earlier and earlier now rather than waiting until it's too late. So um, a lot of exciting things we're going to value here. Thank you for your time. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Uh, looks like we have a few in the chat. I, can you see those? Let me um, see the plan we discussed a little bit. Um, would you mind? Uh, AG with any symptoms? Aspirin. Yes. Yeah, so the question about aspirin, I think, is a very um, germane question to our time now. The, uh, the data on aspirin is really turned on its head. And the current data, regardless of age, is that Aspirin is not clear that aspirin provides any above and beyond benefit unless you've had established coronary, established stroke or established heart attack or coronary disease. If you, you can be a diabetic and a smoker and have risk factors, but if you don't have coronary disease, aspirin doesn't 
prove, does it show to do what it used to do? And I think that, and the reason is because aspirin is, it's always carried some risk. Most over-the-counter meds carry some risk. Um, and that risk is no different. It's more that we feel the benefits less now than we used to perceive it to be. So now the risk benefit ratio is different. The caveat to all that is most guidelines, most doctors out there say, if you're already taking aspirin, you tolerate it, there's no reason based on the guidelines you should necessarily discontinue aspirin. If you're naive to it and you've never taken it, don't know if you tolerate it, most physicians would not start it in unless you had established coronary disease. So if you've been on it, tolerate it, even though you don't have to be on it anymore, it's kind of dealer's choice. And for most patients, I leave it up to them if they tolerate it. If, they, if they've had any issues, bruising, I stop it. I wouldn't start it, but if they've taken it, they're tolerated, I leave it up to them. Um, Dr. Eng, would you mind unsharing your screen so we can see everybody? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. There we go. Then, if okay, that makes it easier for me too. So Just next sure. question. Uh, vigorous uh, is walking to the vigorous. Yes, well, everything's with a caveat. So if I walk leisurely with the Starbucks Frappuccino one hand and, I, and I'm chatting it up, probably not. So generally we think of walking as saying, doesn't matter what type of activity, but enough to either uh, subjectively work up a sweat or subjectively say, I've done enough that it's hard to carry on a leisurely conversation. If you wanna say, let's look at some, I'm a more objective guy, let's look at numbers. Most people say, you know, 220 minus your age is theoretically your max predicted heart rate. And for aerobic activity, most people say somewhere around 65, 70% of that number. So you can do the math, 220 minus your age, 65, 70%. That's the, the aerobic threshold for you to maintain. You can reasonably maintain it and not go into anaerobic thresholds, but you're still getting in a, a reasonable workout. Um, and the last question about uh, blood clots. You're right, you know, blood clots, pulmonary embolisms, do whether they're just advertised more frequently, but we do hear about them. I think part of we're hearing about them more is because the newer blood thinners are on the market and they're not um, they're not generic and there's a market to be made. So some of it is public education, but some is financially driven. But for a long time, blood clots, pulmonary embolisms have been uh, under recognized. D dimers are it's a it's a very it's a two sided coin with uh, D dimer. D-dimer is a very non-specific measure of inflammation in your body. So if I came in and I was uh, had a bad infection, I'd expect my D-dimer to be high. Um, and if you had a blood clot, we'd expect D-dimer to be high. So if it's normal, it does not. If it's if it's high, it doesn't guarantee a blood clot. But if your D-dimer is normal, it can almost fully exclude. The chance of having a clot. So a lot of times the ER to triage will say, hey, let's check your D-dimer. If it's low, no further workups needed for blood clots. If it's high, it may or may not be. And if they're suspicious enough, they'll get the appropriate scans that cost some, not just finances, but radiation. So it's a good, it has a very, it's very specific, but not very sensitive. I think that's all the questions in the chat. Are there any other? If you could raise your hand uh, visually or through the through the Zoom, that would be great. Anybody have any other questions for Dr. Ng? No. Okay. Um, Doctor, do you have any uh, last comments or? No. Thank you, really, Matt. Opportunity. I mean, I feel this area is home for me, and and I've been here for eleven years, and I probably be here for another twenty years. So. Wonderful. Well, we're so, so thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, we're so lucky to have you uh, at Stanford uh, Healthcare Valley Care. I know some some more members have utilized your uh, gifts and your skills. Uh, so I hope you stay here for many years to come. And I I know I learned one thing. I need to walk a little faster when I'm walking uh, to get my heart rate up. So um, and thank you, Shelby. I didn't mention you earlier for coordinating this with us. We really appreciate your support and help. And uh, here's to a uh, successful 2022. And thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.